I think it's likely we can go down a little bit and beat the star. Slides are not yet on the agenda, but will be uploaded after the talk. So, uh, Suvrat, I encourage you to start sharing your screen. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, good afternoon to everyone, and um, uh, thanks to the organizers for organizing this uh, online workshop. And thanks to Professor Marco Drews for inviting me uh, to talk here. Um, uh, today, what I'm going to be talking about is maybe uh, very different from uh, most of the other talks here. Um, and I represent uh, the researchers from uh, University of Hamburg and uh, DAISY uh, in Germany. Uh, and uh, uh, recently, we came up uh, with um, a novel um, idea for and a highly interdisciplinary idea to detect uh, gravitational wave signatures using uh, circular particle accelerators. Um, so that's uh, what I'm going to be talking about and the role of heavy ions um, uh, to better enable these detections. Um, uh, so uh, the talk I'm giving right now is based on um, uh, the paper uh, uh, titled Detection of Gravitational Waves in Circular Particle Accelerators uh, that came out um, late last year. And it was immediately followed uh, by uh, an international workshop by CERN um, to discuss uh, the detection of gravitational waves in the storage rings, uh, where uh, uh, a different uh, group prior, uh, previously belonging to um, SLAC uh, and later uh, uh, now working at IPHT Paris, they confirmed our main calculations. Um, so uh, what I want to do is first uh, give a brief um, uh, outline of the experiment concept and then revise quickly a few uh, fundamental concepts about gravitational waves uh, so that we are on the same page and then uh, discuss the main experiment and uh, the role of um, heavy ions. So uh, the outline is uh, uh, quite simple. Um, so uh, in this case, we have a circular particle accelerator, um, which is being employed as a storage ring. So there are no collisions in this experiment. Um, and uh, we can have uh, an astrophysical gravitational wave source, such as um, a merger of two uh, uh, binary black holes, which produces gravitational waves, uh, which, I'm sure, which I've shown here at, at uh, B, uh, by the effect on um, uh, the passing passage effect on a ring of uh, um, uh, test mass particles. So as these gravitational waves travel, they distort space-time in a complex manner, uh, causing a stretching and squeezing of space-time in two mutually perpendicular directions. Um, and when uh, these distortions pass through uh, a storage ring, we would expect that they would uh, change the trajectories of the uh, ions or proton bunch uh, test masses. And uh, what we have found is that the most significant effect is along the longitudinal or the tangential direction. Um, and this uh, shows as a change in the uh, net travel time or the periodicity of the particles from what we expect in the absence of gravitational waves. And we propose to detect this by using an external uh, pro uh, time tagging detector, which would time tag uh, these proton or ion bunches. Uh, which is connected to a high precision uh, optical or atomic clock. So basically this is a timing experiment and the gravitational wave signature uh, is expected to be present uh, in the timing data. Um, so uh, before we move on into the details, I would like to quickly go through some um, uh, fundamentals of gravitational wave physics. So uh, gravitational waves are transverse waves. So their effect is perpendicular to their propagation direction. And they are also uh, in general rel relativity, they're called traceless because they have equal and opposite effects along two mutually perpendicular directions. And like electromagnetic waves, they, they can have two polarizations, but these are 45 degrees apart, not 90 degrees apart. But they're called a plus and a cross polarization. And uh, in the GIFs above, you see these two polarizations and the effect uh, of the distortion of space time on a ring of uh, test masses, uh, circular test masses, which is being distorted. Uh, and in this case, the uh, wave is propagating into the plane of your computer screen. Um, and of course, uh, because these uh, sources can be located anywhere in uh, the sky, the propagation direction may not be oriented uh, properly with the ring of the test masses. 
So in that case, uh, you would have to account for the orientation and you can do this by considering the three Euler angles, uh, theta, phi and psi. Um, so another way to visualize this is that uh, because this comes from general relativity, so if you have a field of test mass particles and the, the plus polarization is uh, the gravitational wave is passing through the plane of your computer screen, then in the image you see how this uh, test masses would uh, shift from their original positions. Um, so it is, you can visualize it similar to the expansion of the universe so that there is no absolute or central reference frame. In this case, uh, this is the distortion as seen by an observer sitting on the middle uh, test mass. But if you shift to a different test mass, you would see again the same thing. So there is no absolute reference frame. Um, so in the case of, um, uh, as we all know, uh, LIGO uh, has discovered uh, gravitational waves, uh, has made the first direct detection of gravitational waves in 2016 using laser interferometry. So uh, laser interferometry exploits this um, effect uh, so that when the gravitational waves pass through a Michelson interferometer, it changes the path lengths of the laser beams. And uh, so the gravitational wave signal is recorded as uh, an oscillation in the interferometer pattern. Um, so now um, this figure will be very useful uh, for the rest of the talk. Uh, this is basically uh, on the y-axis, you have the strength of gravitational wave um, um, signals. And on the x-axis, you have the frequency of gravitational wave and the colored boxes are uh, the predictions uh, of gravitational wave signals from various uh, astrophysical events. Um, and the black curves are basically the sensitivity curves of the different gravitational wave detectors that are employed or will be employed in the future. So you have LIGO and LISA in the future. LIGO, uh, as you can see, is more sensitive to high frequency gravitational waves. And you have pulsar timing, which is more sensitive to very low frequency gravitational waves. And then you have uh, LISA, which is a space-based uh, interferometer, which uh, is to be launched in 2034 that will be sensitive to these uh, millihertz gravitational waves with a period of hours to days. Um, um, okay, so coming to the main uh, topic, um, the main concept here is that um, in this case, you have a storage ring uh, with um, heavy ions or proton bunches uh, circulating uh, at a, a constant uh, velocity. And um, so these are basically acting like test masses uh, and they are free test masses, at least along the circular tangential or longitudinal direction. And the effect of a distortion of space time uh, as gravitational waves passing through changes the periodicity and this periodicity or the change in the net travel time from the expected value. And the change that we calculate or show here in this study is uh, due to the change in the test mass velocity, not due to the orbit distortion. Uh, so the way we calculate this is by basically considering, it's a general a theoretical general relativistic calculation. Um, we consider the uh, well-known uh, um, general relativistic gravitational wave metric, which is a linearized gravity metric in the transverse traceless gauge. And basically we calculate the time-like geodesic equations of this metric for uh, te a test masses, which are um, in a circular trajectory, as in storage rings. And we integrate these time like geodesic equations and find the deviation of the travel time from uh, its expected value. So this delta TGW is the main signal that we are looking for, which is basically the uh, time at which uh, a particle arrives at your detector um, minus the time at which it would have arrived in the absence of gravitational waves. So in pulsar timing, uh, this quantity is known as a timing residue. So it's the same concept. Um, and we find that it uh, goes as an integral um, of uh, this quantity called H plus of T, which is nothing but a gravitational wave waveform depending on the gravitational wave source. So if you have a binary black hole merger that would produce a, a typical signature, a gravitational wave um, and that is convolved uh, with this quantity f plus which is uh, which has uh, is called the antenna pattern of the detector 
which depends on the orientation at which um, the gravitational wave is aligned with your storage ring. And uh, uh, it is a function of all the Euler angles that we saw earlier. Um, so to get some estimates, uh, what we did was we considered the ansatz of a simple linearly polarized a continuous gravitational wave, so a simple sinusoid function, where this H0 is the characteristic strain, the strength of gravitational waves, and FGW is the frequency. And uh, we wanted to get an estimate of this quantity. So we inputted that uh, and made the calculation uh, and averaged it over uh, all orientations. Uh, and we found that uh, based on the predicted um, astrophysical uh, gravitational wave uh, signals, um, what we would find is that um, in a storage ring, uh, this delta TGW at max for the strongest gravitational wave sources uh, would go as uh, around 0.1 femtoseconds, the order of 0.1 femtoseconds, so a very, very tiny effect. Uh, and this would be achieved over uh, the passage of one period of the gravitational wave. So as you begin your experiment, you would see that the, um, in the presence of gravitational waves, and assuming that all the noise sources are taken care of, your um, uh, time tagging detector would start observing that your particle bunches start coming, uh, start deviating from their expected arrival time, and this deviation would reach a peak which is uh, the number given there for the strongest astrophysical sources. And then over time, it would again uh, come back to its uh, expected value uh, because there, it, 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 this is a periodic signal which goes with the periodicity of the gravitational waves. Um, so here I compare the antenna patterns of uh, this um, uh, storage ring gravitational wave detector and the famous LIGO uh, antenna pattern. So what we see here is that gravitational wave telescopes or detectors are basically sensitive to all directions, unlike an astronomical telescope. And we see a difference between the LIGO uh, Michelson interferometer antenna pattern and the storage ring antenna pattern. In this case, uh, the circular accelerator is in the XY plane uh, with its center at the origin. Um, and another distinction that I would like to make is that um, any change in travel time or periodicity can come from two uh, sources. One is if the shape of the beam orbit is distorted, that can lead to a travel time um, change. Otherwise, uh, if there's a change in the velocity, that can also cause a travel time change. But uh, what we've seen here is that um, any orbit distortion uh, always causes a travel time change that goes as the square of the uh, gravitational wave strain in the leading order. And because this gravitational wave strain is a very tiny number, it's very small, so um, this, uh, the square of that would be even smaller. Whereas a velocity change causes a travel time change which that is directly proportional to h. So that is therefore the significant effect on the travel time. That's always um, significant and uh, therefore the orbit distortion travel time change always becomes negligible. And, and this orbit distortion is actually maximum for the case where the gravitational wave is propagating perpendicular to the plane of the ring. Uh, whereas in that particular orientation, the velocity change is minimum. In fact, it is null. And that uh, is a very interesting uh, thing because uh, there have been many previous works, old works, which have explored the interaction of gravitational waves with storage rings. And unfortunately, they only considered uh, this particular orientation where the gravitational wave is perpendicular to the ring, and therefore they missed this effect that we have discovered uh, in our calculations. Uh, and so they always found that the travel time change went as a square of the strain, and therefore they concluded that it was too negligible to ever be detected. Whereas uh, what we find now is that um, that is only a consequence of this particular orientation that they were looking at. Um, so, as in, as with any sensitive uh, detection experiment, there would be many noise sources which would uh, interfere with a signal that we are trying to uh, observe in the uh, uh, travel time data uh, by causing uh, stochastic or deterministic uh, travel time changes of their own. Um, so, these sources would broadly be divided, as I said, into two categories, one which cause a deterministic noise so uh, which 
uh, would go as a function of time, but which is too complex to model. So either it ha has to be technologically eliminated or we have to somehow account for it. Um, and other noise sources, which would cause a stochastic noise, which would be like a uh, stochastic random jitter uh, in the timing data. And these sources, uh, in our paper, we explore six main um, uh, no noise sources, but uh, we are sure that there are many, many more. Um, and because we come from um, more uh, from the gravitational wave physics point of view, and uh, we still need more uh, research in the accelerator science uh, field. So this is still a very uh, highly interdisciplinary and uh, new topic, which needs a lot of uh, research to complete this list of noise sources. So these noise sources are very um, um, varied. Um, they can uh, come from quantum uh, uncertainties in time tagging, uh, from uh, the gravity gradient uh, of nearby objects and other objects like the sun, moon, etc., which uh, and uh, the, the tides basically, which distort the ring, or even um, have a, a direct a coupling with the uh, uh, heavy ion or proton bunches. It can also come from seismic noise, which um, uh, vibrates the ground and therefore um, causes a relative displacement between uh, the dipole magnets, which all then translates into a distortion of the beam orbit, which causes a travel time change. Otherwise, you also have uh, the RF system, which uh, adds its own noise, uh, its own timing jitter. And then whatever detector you're using to time tag the proton bunches or the ion bunches would also have an intrinsic um, uh, uncertainty or a, a, a timing jitter of its own. And the way in which you detect the time tag these proton bunches, if you are using um, a single photon detector to detect the synchrotron radiation to time tag these bunches, then you would also have the photon shot noise. And there are many, many other sources uh, to be considered. So speaking about the, uh, the detector, as again, as I uh, mentioned earlier, we, these, th this experiment does not involve any collisions of the particles. So if you're talking about the LHC, then we're uh, operating it as a storage ring. Um, and technically, I forgot to mention that this concept can actually be applied to any circular particle accelerator. It's valid for any storage ring. But in our first paper, we actually did a case study on the LHC. Um, so that's why in this talk, I'm talking about the LHC in particular. Um, so speaking about the detector, we would uh, uh, need a, a non-invasive, ultra-fast and high-precision detector. Uh, and we assume that this can be done um, because the technology currently looks uh, promising so that this can be achieved in the near future. And the purpose of such a detector is that it would need to accurately, consecutively, and continuously time tag the proton or ion bunches because uh, that would increase the number of data points, which is helpful for noise filtering. Um, and then the detector itself can be of uh, uh, many types. We are still not sure which would be the best one. Uh, but there are many possibilities. You can have single photon detectors, which do time tagging by detecting the synchrotron radiation from these emitted from these particles. Uh, or you can have beam position monitors or short key signal detectors, etc. One important concept is that this is a timing experiment. So the clock which is present in your detector has to be highly precise. That means that because the signal that you're trying to detect is very small of the order of femtoseconds. So the least count of a detector clock has to be at least smaller than that. Otherwise, even if you have no noise, you will never be able to detect any signal. Right? Uh, fortunately, uh, we already have a promising technology. Even the latest uh, optical or atomic clocks have a pre timing precision of 10 to the minus 19 seconds. So that's, that's very good. Um, so the main uh, result of our study is that um, well, the main concept is that your signal basically has to be bigger than the noise. And we assume that uh, any deterministic noise is accounted for, etc. And we are dealing here with stochastic noise. And we make an estimate for the stochastic noise, at least at the LHC. And this noise can be uh, uh, attenuated by using uh, noise filtering techniques. So that even if your actual noise is much bigger than uh, your signal, we can still dig the signal out of the noise 
uh, by having many, many data points. So, uh, the number of data points is basically the quantity inside the square root, and the effective noise is reduced by the square root of the number of data points. So that would basically be the sampling rate, the rate at which your detector time tags uh, the bunches per second um, times the total observation time. Um, and we, we, as I showed, we made calculations for this quantity and estimations for this quantity for the LHC. And also we know the, uh, the sampling rate, maximum sampling rate possible at the LHC based on the velocity of the proton bunches and how many proton bunches can be injected. Let's say uh, currently maximum 2,800 uh, of that kind of that number. Um, so that would allow us to basically calculate uh, the sensitivity curve, which says which kind of astrophysical events we can hope to detect. And that falls exactly over the millihertz uh, range. And so these events, which are above this black curve drawn for the LHC, uh, uh, show an estimate of uh, what events we can hope to detect with this uh, experiment concept. Um, so one direct uh, application or uh, advantage of this is that uh, we have this proposed LISA, uh, uh, laser interferometer space antenna, which is like LIGO, but it would be space-based uh, gravitational detector, which would be uh, along a sun orbit, lagging uh, the Earth orbit by 20 degrees. Uh, so if we can detect the same events uh, that LISA detects uh, using this experiment, then we can use that to increase um, the triangulation uh, of the gravitational wave source in the sky. So gravitational wave detectors use a triangulation method to pinpoint where the uh, gravitational wave source is in the um, sky. So that would allow, the, so this kind of an Earth-based detector would help improve that by giving an additional baseline for triangulation. Um, and one more main uh, thing to keep in mind is that because uh, we are talking here about millihertz gravitational waves, um, so over the order of hours or days, uh, basically we have to take into account the effect of Earth's rotation so that the orientation of the gravitational waves uh, with respect to your ring is continuously changing with time. So that would modify the signal. So currently we are doing simulations of the signal, uh, the pure signal without the noise, uh, using realistic gravitational wave, astrophysical gravitational wave uh, waveforms and accounting for this uh, uh, effect of the Earth's rotation. Um, and we find uh, a particular case I'm showing as an example here. Um, so this, the envelope of this curve is basically the effect of Earth's rotation on the y-axis is basically the delta t gw is the main signal that we're looking for and on the x-axis is the observation time and so the signal varies periodically with the period of gravitational waves and then the period of the envelope is the uh, effect of earth's rotation um, and uh, as i showed you earlier um, in this case in the beginning of the observation run uh, the gravitational wave is perpendicular to the plane of the ring where this effect becomes null but after the rotation of Earth at a particular orientation, 12 hours later, it becomes edge on to the ring and then you get a huge effect. So uh, this itself is interesting because the effect of the Earth's rotation alone can be used to do uh, a localization of the source in the sky. Um, so some of the pros of this detection technique are that um, what we have shown is that detection of millihertz gravitational waves is possible on Earth. Uh, and this can potentially be carried out in existing facilities. So we don't have to build something from scratch. Maybe it is possible to detect this in um, existing storage ring facilities like the LHC. Um, and this can complement the space-based uh, gravitational wave detectors for sky localization. And based on the current status of technology, it doesn't seem very unreasonable uh, that we can actually do this somewhere in the, uh, sometime in the future. And there is also the possibility that if we um, can achieve this uh, before LISA is launched in 2034, then we can detect millihertz gravitational waves already. Um, now, uh, the significance of this for the current workshop uh, is um, uh, here that um, uh, there are a few unanswered questions of 
uh, how to take this, uh, how to realize this experiment and uh, the role of heavy ions in doing this. So uh, as I mentioned, there was a CERN workshop uh, where uh, we discussed this with many uh, researchers from, uh, worldwide. And uh, we came to some conclusions uh, that firstly, uh, if you have an RF system in your storage ring, then the RF system itself can attenuate this gravitational wave signal or add its own noise. So there was a suggestion that we can use instead coasting beams without an RF, but then the problem comes that they suffer from uh, the collisions with the gas, rest gas inside uh, the vacuum tubes, which is not a perfect vacuum. So uh, over time, these collisions would dampen um, or add its own noise or make the, uh, the beam disappear. So how to overcome this is an unanswered question. Um, for this, many suggestions were made uh, of using isochronous optics, or crystalline beams, or having a single ion storage ring, or uh, having a high vacuum cryogenic storage rings. And it was also realized that a smaller ring size would maybe help eliminate many of the noise sources. So the uh, main conclusion of the CERN workshop was actually that this experiment is, is valid, as was uh, confirmed by uh, another team, which confirmed our main calculations. But uh, we realized that the LHC may not actually be the best place to realize it due to the noise sources and due to the noise sources alone. Um, so uh, the reason, uh, the context for this workshop is that um, it, what we saw earlier is that the GW signal is actually independent of the mass or the type of particle that you use or even the size of the ring. And this is due to the equivalence principle of general relativity, but the noise sources completely depend on uh, which particle you're using and uh, the technology of the uh, way in which you're handling the storage. So um, the idea was that to explore whether heavy ions offer a, a reduction, a significant reduction in the noise, which would allow us to realize this experiment. So uh, currently there is no research uh, I mean, this is a new topic, so I don't have any answers for this, only questions. So uh, the first things that come to mind are in using heavy ions is whether uh, they would be less affected by collisions due to a higher momentum, whether they would emit less synchrotron radiation, and whether it would be easier to produce slow moving coasting beams, um, which can um, stay for a long time. So because in this case, we are trying to observe millihertz gravitational waves. So we would require this experiment to run for the order of at least hours, days, uh, during which uh, the gravitational wave uh, effect may be observed. So how to realize this is still an unanswered question. And hopefully we um, are able to discuss um, if heavy ions can contribute um, towards this. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So we are running late, uh, so maybe we take uh, a limited number of questions. Uh, um, so uh, any any questions from the audience? David, please. Did you hear me? I, I no, was... no, no, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I'd like to hear about, about this proposal by the accelerator people, Roderick and, and company. Yeah, in fact, I see. I, in particular, yeah. regarding the heavy ions, of course, which is a topic of, of the worship. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Roderick. Hello. Yeah, uh, yes. No, um, thanks. It's a very interesting talk. So concerning your points there on the last slide, I mean, when, uh, for example, um, looking first at the radiation, we know mm -hmm. that ions, they damp faster than protons uh, mm -hmm. because of the much higher charge. So I would rather say they probably emit more synchrotron radiation. Um, we, we have a damping time, I think, in LHC, which is about half with heavy ions compared to proton for equivalent magnetic rigidity. And I, I also see. don't see, for the um, uh, rest gas molecules, why would they be less affected by that? Or, or what do you mean by affected? You mean the, the fraction of beam colliding or the total number of collisions or what exactly? Yeah, I, I, I think I'm... I meant that uh, um, would uh, heavy ions be less susceptible uh, to be deviated by collisions with rest gas molecules? And so that um, if you're time tagging a particular ion and uh, 
it would survive for a longer time without uh, being deviated so much that it gets lost. Ah, uh, I see what you mean. Okay. Well, there are of course different physics processes, and I, I think the cross sections for for inelastic interactions, where the ion disintegrates and fragments into something else, uh, mm. this is significantly higher for uh, for ions than for protons when you collide with the rest gas. And what you're talking about is more elastic scattering. There, I don't remember the cross sections by heart. Um, I would have to check this, but uh, I don't have the feeling that. I mean, it's clear that you will get. If your ion survives, yes, you can get. You will get smaller scattering angles, but uh, if the total cross section is. Okay, to be checked. To be checked. And with the less radiation emitted, you, you, you mean there. Uh, you're talking there also about how much the ion is deviated from the trajectory, is what you mean? Or... Mm -hmm. Yes. So that. Uh, yeah, the main point is that. Um... Is there any advantage of using heavy ions over photons uh, in, in the sense that uh, any noise sources that cause uh, their own deviation of the travel time would be attenuated? Okay, I see, I see. Um, yeah, I mean, still, uh, if, you, if you consider the emittance dumping time, uh, I think ions probably for a, from a radiation point of view are more, more affected, actually. Uh, I see. Because they, they emit much more radiation due to the higher charge. Um, okay, so based on your, your arguments, uh, though, it's actually more useful to have protons than ions for physics. Just looking at it like this, probably yes. I don't know if somebody else wants to, um, wants to comment. Okay, uh, I propose that Christoph asks his question. And then Marco. So uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. A very interesting talk. Um, my question is actually, if I understood correctly, you really want to trace single ions around the ring. So doesn't that require that you have also only a single ion per bunch? It depends. I mean, if you're able to track a bunch, then that's also OK. Or if you're able to track a single ion, it's OK. I mean, your test mass can be anything. As but but in the bunch, then you don't know which of the particles in the bunch emitted the Bremsstrahlung's photon. So you actually have quite a large spread in space where you emit the photon. So doesn't this completely dilute the measurement? Yes, exactly. So in, in that case, either you have a technology which can track single ions, or if you're using bunches, then uh, you should have a detector that's um, uh, a very ultra fast detector that can detect many photon emissions from the same bunch, but then you would have uh, very less time to detect many photons from the same bunch. So you're, uh, if you're using a single photon detector, it would have to have a very small dead time. Um, so yeah, this is a, an unanswered question yet, uh, which is the best way to do it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Great, thanks. Uh, Marco, please. Oh, my question was, Kind of related to the last point. So, so as Rudy already pointed out, as far as human lifetime is concerned, and say collision with collision cross section is concerned, heavy ions tend to be worse. But then you crucially rely on timing information. And kind of related to the last question, I was wondering, well, that's more a question to, to Roderick and others. John, maybe, is how, how well one can obtain the timing information about individual objects, either bunches or ions, compared. Because I think that's that's the key measurement, right? And it's like you're right. It's, sort of, right? it's a timing experiment, essentially. Yeah, this is a timing experiment, yes. So so it depends not only on how long the beam lasts, of course, because it gives you the integrated time, but also how precisely you can extract timing information. That's quite related to the last question. So I don't know if the, the experts can comment on this. Yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, all these factors. Uh, uh, yet unanswered. So, yeah, so the story is that uh, we come from the gravitational wave physics side. So, uh, that's how uh, we made this exploration and uh, uh, made the first publication. But then we realized that if you really want to uh, uh, have an accurate uh, realization of this, then you, of course, you need a lot of uh, research on the accelerator science side. So, all these points that you make are valid, but uh, 
yeah, currently, I guess the uh, current agenda is only whether there is any advantage of using heavy ions over any other kind of particle. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Well, maybe for the timing, uh, uh, what Marco mentioned, I think this is a very valid point. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. I mean, we can measure at least the bunches with quite good resolution, but I don't there right now to say a number, maybe somebody else knows. Um, on the other hand, single ions, I think would be extremely difficult to track within a bunch. Um, which, which resolution do you actually um, require on the timing? Um, well, by timing the resolution, do you uh, mean uh, the least count of the detector basically? Yes, that on one hand, and um, yes, yeah, so what was Marco's question exactly? Maybe I misunderstood it. So I, I was wondering that uh, exactly, so how well can you measure timing of objects and by object in total design? So by objects, I mean whatever you can track, maybe if it's not individual ones and bunches. And of course, that was a hand in hand with the question how do the bunches look like? So I think at the moment, the bunches are quite thin and quite long at the LHC. Uh, of course, for such a timing measurement, you might want to make them shorter. And yeah, I don't know whether they, they have no idea what the technical limitations are there for proteins and ions. Because I think that they are like micrometer thin and like a few centimeters long bunches, right? Exactly. Now we have bunches where we are typically order of a bit less than 10 centimeters. Um, yeah. But and to make them a lot shorter, I think this will be difficult. Uh, yeah, yeah so, well, we'll have to look at the numbers. I cannot. Yeah, so there, there's, there's two difficulties. Uh, yeah, if you have a bunch, then uh, all those points, and plus uh, you'd have to consider many other effects, such as um, uh, the repulsions between uh, the uh, ions, which would uh, combine with many other effects, which would uh, cause a stochastic jitter of the bunch itself, and perhaps uh, uh, not just. Um, a shift of the entire bunch, but also uh, an oscillation of the bunch length and many other effects. So if you can get rid of a bunch and if you have a, 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 an exotic you know, single ion uh, storage ring, then the other problem comes in that uh, single ion, after some time it disappears because it collides with the gas molecule and trajectory is blown off. So uh, we actually, um, I read a paper by a Fermilab where they have this uh, IOTA storage ring, where they actually observed um, single electrons um, uh, in the storage ring. But then after some time, the, the electrons would disappear uh, because due to collisions with the uh, uh, rest gas molecules. So then the solution would be to have uh, an ultra high vacuum where you can actually have these ions circulating um, for a period of hours before they, they disappear so that you can make enough uh, measurements on them. Uh, while the gravitational wave passes through. I think at the LHC, the, the um, lifetime due to, uh, due to beam gas is actually very good. I mean, we're looking at something like 50 to 100 hours. Okay, so that, that's actually good. But um, uh, yeah, uh, at the CERN workshop, uh, there was one of the CERN uh, beam um, people, uh, Fritz Kaspers, I think is what it was his name. He ah. argued, uh, uh, on the other hand, that um, it, it seems very unlikely at, at, uh, to be done at the LHC or any other facility at CERN. Is there time for a quick follow-up question? Please do. Yes, uh, we take this one and then we move on to the next talk. So please go ahead. I, I, was, I was actually trying to understand the the precision that you actually need to measure the signal. So as I understand it, you have a transient signal which lasts for order of seconds and you want to have to, to, to measure the difference between the time of the, uh, between the revolution time of the particles within milliseconds to resolve the frequency of your transient signal. So within milliseconds, you want to measure the timing of the revolving particles to better than 10 to the minus 16. Is, is this uh, the resolution that you want? Is this correct? 
it's actually this is not correct. Uh, the signal actually lasts for the gravitational wave signal lasts for hours to days, uh, right? So, um, but uh, the the amplitude of that signal, uh, in terms of the change in the travel time from its expected value, that is of the order of ten to the minus sixteen seconds. So basically, it's saying that um, let's say you have a, a perfectly periodic uh, 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 ion bunch. And uh, in the absence of any noise or any gravitational waves, uh, let's say you have infinite precision, you see that it uh, comes back at the same uh, expected time. And then you can make a prediction into the future exactly when you would expect it to come back again. And now if I turn on my gravitational waves sources, uh, then it would not come at the same time, but it would deviate. And the deviation would be of the order of 10 to the minus 16 seconds. And that's just this. Uh, the peak value of the signal. So this is actually a time varying signal. It would uh, periodically deviate and come back to the expected value uh, uh, following the uh, frequency of the gravitational wave. And the gravitational wave itself lasts for hours to days because we are looking at millihertz sources, right? So uh, millihertz means 10, uh, the range of um, 10 to the minus four hertz to say 10 to the minus two hertz. Thanks okay, a lot. That's clear. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks Sorry. a lot. Um, uh, can I also ask one more thing? Um, you, you, you mentioned the noise from the RF system and that you were, were thinking of having a coasting beam. Yes. Um, now, this seems at a first glance to be a more serious limitation somehow than, than the collisions with the rust gas, which, are, uh, as I said, we have quite long lifetime of many tens or, or even 100 hours. Mm -hmm. um, but if you turn off the RF, you, you will continuously lose energy through uh, radiation. At a certain point, your energy deviation will be so large that you will hit the wall with the particle. And I think this, will, this is not a question of hours. This is, um, yeah, so, um, so you yeah, exactly. the RF yeah. Or because this could be a potential. Yeah, so with every scenario, there is some kind of in, uh, inclusion which uh, prevents us from realizing it. So in the case, if you have an RF, then you can maintain the periodicity and a li a large lifetime, but then the RF would actually, uh, if it is able to adapt uh, or detect the uh, gravitation wave signal, then it would try to attenuate it, or it will add its own noise. And this noise added by the RF is uh, well studied at the LHC. Uh, so if you want to get rid of that, if you turn off the RF, then again, what you mentioned happens is that uh, if you have a coasting beam, and if you, even if you use like isochronous optics and have a bunch coasting beam, then due to these effects, um, uh, that would again cause its own noise. So, so it seems that maybe this is not realizable at the LHC and uh, a certain amount of technological improvement would be required to perhaps um, create a separate dedicated facility where we try to find the sweet spot of all the parameters, the ring size and all these things to really uh, get to a level of sensitivity where uh, we can realize this experiment. Okay, thanks. It was a very exciting discussion, very intense, but I propose to move on.